You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. As well, you can hear these podcasts at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. There are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works Volume 62 by Rudolf Steiner, 14 lectures entitled Results of Spiritual Research, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This was a winter course in Berlin in 1912-1913. This is the last lecture, Lecture 14, given in Berlin on the 10th of April, 1913, entitled The Legacy of the 19th Century. This winter's lecture cycle has sought to characterize, from a variety of points of view, the spiritual stream that has as its aim that of leading the human soul through a process of self-exploration to that knowledge which it must yearn for in connection with the most important riddles of life and existence. The attempt has been made to show how a study of present or future-oriented spiritual and intellectual streams makes it clearly apparent that the spiritual science referred to is the right instrument to guide the human soul in the context of the present and the immediate future time. For this reason, it has been a kind of undertone of these winter lectures, consistently to emphasize the achievements and results of the intellectual life and aspirations of humanity in the 19th century. For if one considers the way that the intellectual life and aspirations of the 19th century have taken hold of humanity, and have brought about the great triumph of material existence, it can truly be said that it would necessarily seem to be a hopeless undertaking if this spiritual science under discussion here were to reject or set itself in opposition to the justified requirements of natural science, or indeed the intellectual and spiritual achievements of the nineteenth century. Thus it will perhaps be seen as an appropriate way of concluding this cycle of lectures that we turn our attention briefly to what we can call the spiritual legacy of the 19th century, in order, through considering this legacy, to be able perhaps to indicate the extent to which the spiritual science that has been spoken of here belongs fully to the present evolutionary cycle of mankind. What does this spiritual science endeavor to be for the soul? Its endeavor for the soul is to be a source of knowledge of its origin in the realm of spirit, to be a source of knowledge of those supersensible worlds to which the soul belongs as a spiritual being. Notwithstanding the fact that the soul lives in the physical world of the senses by virtue of the tools and instruments of its body. Its endeavor is, therefore, to demonstrate conclusively that this soul is a citizen of the supersensible worlds. It endeavors to show that if the soul applies to itself those methods that have been spoken of here in the course of this winter, it can undergo a development whereby cognitive forces are awakened within it which are not exactly on the same wavelength as the rest of a person's life, but which, when they are developed, do indeed enable this soul to find its place in the worlds to which it actually belongs with its higher being. To the extent that the soul discovers these forces within itself, it comes to recognize itself as a being with respect to which birth and death, or shall we say conception and death, represent limits in the same sense that the blue firmament of heaven has represented a boundary or limit for the scientifically oriented cognitive soul since the dawn of modern natural science approximately since the time of Giordano Bruno and those who were of a like mind to him. Through the soul becoming conscious of the forces that slumber within it, something similar emerges in it as regards the spiritual domain of time to what arose in it with respect to outward knowledge of the material domain of space in the time of the dawn of modern natural science. When, for example, Giordano Bruno indicated that this blue celestial vault, which for many centuries had been regarded as a reality, is no more than a limit that human knowledge 
places upon itself through a kind of incapacity, and which it can overcome when it understands itself. Just as Giordano Bruno showed that behind this blue vault of heaven the infinite sea of space opens up with infinite worlds encompassed within it, so is it the task of spiritual science to show that that limit or boundary that is placed by conception and death exists only because the faculties of the human soul are no less limited than they were when limited spatially by the blue celestial vault. And then when one's conception of the spiritual realities in which the soul is involved is enabled to extend toward the infinity lying beyond birth and death, the soul recognizes itself as passing through repeated earthly lives. So the life of the soul takes its course on the one hand between birth and death, and on the other hand in the time from death until a new birth. When we devote our attention to the spiritual widths of time, in the way that natural science has ventured into the widths of space, the human soul, in that it enters the life between birth and death, from the life that it has pursued between death and the last birth, recognizes itself both as the co-creator of the finer organization of its own body and as the fashioner of the shaping of its own destiny. It has moreover been said, it has been less emphasized this winter than in previous years, but it can be studied in spiritual scientific literature, that when the soul comprehends itself in its deeper aspects, It also traces its life back to those times when life in bodily forms of existence had its origin, that it can trace itself back to those times when it was already in existence before our earthly planet had acquired its material form, before the earth as a material form itself originated from a purely spiritual, primal essence in which the human soul was already present in its earliest condition even before the arising of the kingdoms of nature, the animal, plant, and mineral kingdoms that surround us. And the perspective of a future opens up that the human soul has to enter when earthly incarnations will have come to fulfillment, a future in which it will pass over into a purely spiritual world which will come in the earth's stead, so that one can look toward a future that the human soul will enter purely spiritually and in such a way that it has to bring the fruits of the forms of earthly life to what it will attain as a spiritual domain as though in a primal condition of existence. However, it will not reach it in the same form as it left it, but with the result of everything that can be acquired in earthly incarnations. If the soul takes hold of itself, in such a way that it intensifies within itself the forces slumbering within it, it also recognizes itself in connection with worlds that are themselves the source of our earthly planet. It recognizes itself as a citizen of the whole universe. Spiritual science can widen its awareness from the successive earthly lives of the individual soul to the successive lives of the planets and even of the sun, in the universe. The method is therefore one that consists in the self-education of the soul down to its deeper forces. The result is the knowledge of both the origin and the direction of the life of soul. The knowledge that the primal source is the spirit to which the soul belongs, that it is the spirit which causes matter to arise from it and which brings it into its various forms and that the most important form that initially evokes our interest is that of the human body. This knowledge will, therefore, have to become part of human consciousness in the near future, that the spirit is the first and highest aspect, that the spirit releases matter from itself as water gives rise to ice, that it is the spirit that adopts its outward form in the human body, that the spirit as a connection with the spiritual influences, realities, and beings of the world, and that the human soul is a citizen of this world of spiritual realities and beings that give rise from themselves to all outward material existence, 
pour it into the corresponding forms that make up the surrounding universe that we can perceive with our senses. This is how I would briefly characterize the methods and results that constitute what is here referred to as spiritual science. This spiritual science is only in its beginnings at our present time. It has frequently been emphasized that it must be thoroughly understandable if enemies and opponents of this spiritual science still rise up today from every side. This must be especially understandable for someone who does himself stand firmly on the ground of this spiritual science and is aware of its particular nature in the context of present-day cultural life as a whole. It is not surprising that this spiritual science finds enemies and opponents, that people view it as fantasy, daydreaming, and perhaps sometimes as something much worse. It would be far more surprising if, bearing in mind the particular nature of this spiritual science, there were at present more voices of recognition and encouragement than is the case. For it certainly seems as though not only the results of this spiritual science, but also the whole way of thinking and imagining that must be cultivated here, are at variance with all the habits of thought and ways of understanding things that have arisen for mankind through the legacy of the nineteenth century. However, this only appears to be so, and one may say that it appears thus most strongly to those who believe that they must stand on the firm foundation of this legacy of the nineteenth century in such a way that they consider only a materialistic or a materialistically inclined way of viewing the world to be compatible with this legacy of the nineteenth century. To the spiritual scientist himself, what he must recognize as this spiritual science is by no means at variance with the legacy of the nineteenth century. For one can also say from the standpoint of this spiritual science that what this nineteenth century has bestowed so hopefully and also so fruitfully upon mankind in the most diverse realms of evolution will, in a certain way, shine as a light over all future epochs of human development. It is naturally impossible to speak exhaustively about the entire world with regard to this question of the legacy of the nineteenth century, but even if one were, for example, to confine oneself to what the structure of the spiritual and intellectual life of Central Europe or the West shows, one would have to say that much, much light emanates from a real understanding of the significance of what is presented there. But there has also been an inordinate amount of what one might often describe as a dizzying quantity of changes and diversity in the cultural development of the nineteenth century so that the observer could sometimes be so fascinated by something or other that he could easily be led to become one-sided and thus overestimate its significance. He will perhaps only be rescued from this predicament through the fact that the achievements of the nineteenth century and the different pictures of cultural development are such that one picture is succeeded by another and a great degree of diversity presents itself. We can, of course, select only some of these, and we shall turn our attention now to the following. Such a sense of hope for what may arise within the human soul, and for what it can become if it becomes conscious of and makes use of its powers, is represented at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries by the great philosopher of the West, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who at that very time wrote his famous book titled The Destiny of Man. If one examines how he expressed himself to his most trusted friends and to those closest to him during his work on this book, one finds that he was enabled to look into the deepest mysteries of man's cognitive and religious sensibilities. If one then peruses this book, one may be fascinated by a kind of personal testimony that the human soul is seeking in this book for the sake of its certainty, for the sake of its hope. One receives still more from the way that Fichte, in a first chapter, begins by saying that the knowledge gained through the outward observation of nature and the physical world presents one with little more than a dream, from the way that 
he wants to show in later chapters, how the soul takes hold of itself in its will, how it becomes certain of its own existence. Then, through the particular explanations that he gives and through the composition of the book as a whole, an impression that can be characterized as follows. This human soul has tried to pose to itself the question, Can I stand firm in my own existence if I have no trust in all the knowledge that is presented to me through my senses and through what my outward intellect beholds? In the style of his time, Fichte answers this resoundingly in the affirmative. What is most impressive about this book is precisely what it can become for the soul through its manner of expression, through the inward surety of tone, which is sure of itself in spite of the refusal to rely on a knowledge of appearances. Now, this book appeared in the midst of a striving on the part of Western cultural life for the sources of human confidence and human knowing. It was preceded by a time when Fichte was summoning up the forces to comprehend the human soul in so powerful a way, the so-called high point of philosophical endeavor. What Fichte himself attempted, what Schelling, what Schopenhauer endeavored to do, what has been attempted in the philosophical domain in the first third of the nineteenth century in order to enter into the mysteries of the world with the power of human thinking, all this, and one can today make whatever one wishes of the results of this intellectual upsurge, had a powerful influence upon every feeling and sensing human soul through the way that people felt and willed in this entire endeavor. If one is aware of what Schelling, out of a conception of the world, given substance through the intellect, but then conceived more imaginatively, seeks by way of a world picture that is able to bear him beyond all matter into the spiritual evolution of the world, if one then turns to Hegel's intellectual striving, which entrusts to man the power to penetrate into the inner nature of things solely through the power of thought, so that Hegel wanted to make it clear to the human soul that in the power of thought it has the sources wherein all forces of the world flow and wherein one has everything in order, as it were, to comprehend oneself in the realm of the eternal. One will indeed be conscious of a powerful struggle being enacted within humanity. One only needs to maintain the hope and the confidence that were linked to this powerful struggle. And again, when one looks back, one may perhaps become aware of something that for those contemplating this whole period of time that is being briefly referred to here more deeply can shed light upon its origin. Thus, in considering the year 1784, one comes across a little characteristic treatise by Kant, which bears the title, Was ist Aufklärung? What is Enlightenment? The almost pedantic style does not always enable one to sense how deeply the sometimes thoroughly intellectual thoughts of this treatise are rooted in the whole struggle of the human soul in the modern age. What is Enlightenment? Kant posed this question the same Kant who, through the often chaotic but nevertheless forceful striving of the human spirit, as came to manifestation, for example, in Rousseau, was so moved that when he became acquainted with Rousseau's writings, and this is no mere anecdote, he had no peace, but put his whole daily routine in complete disorder, and at a completely irregular time, and this was a person according to whose daily walk one could set one's clock, went for a walk in Königsberg. But one knows how Kant's soul was shaken by the freedom movement of the 18th century. In the statements that we read when we take this little book of his into our hands, this becomes, one might say, monumentally apparent to us. Enlightenment, says Kant, is the human soul's freeing itself from its self-inflicted dependence. Dare to make use of your powers of reason, This pronouncement appears in Kant's book from 1784. One really only properly appreciates the other statements in the book if one is clear that something of the nature of a first coming of the human soul to itself comes to expression in them. 
Let us try by means of a simple thought to see Kant's two pronouncements from his essay of 1784 in their true light. Descartes, who as a philosopher did not long precede Kant, the not long should be viewed in the context of world evolution, reduced everything to a striking, significant proposition. He referred the human soul to its own thinking and did something of the kind that Augustine had already done in the early Christian centuries. The aphorism that resounded like a ground tone of the soul life of Descartes was, quote, I think, therefore I am, close quote. And with this he was saying something similar to what Augustine had previously said. One can doubt the entire world, but in doubting one is thinking, and in that one thinks one is, and in that one understands oneself in thinking. One has understood the nature of existence within one's own being. According to Descartes, it is impossible for a person of sound mind to know himself as a thinking soul and to doubt in his existence. I think, therefore I am. In spite of the fact that Augustine preceded him in formulating such a proposition, for the century of Descartes and for what continued to resound into the 18th century, this aphorism was of the greatest significance. But if one now follows the way that Descartes proceeds to form a world conception with this aphorism as a foundation, one sees that he consistently excludes what has been handed down as traditions from previous centuries. One sees that with his thinking, with what seeks to spring forth from the human soul itself, he calls a halt to what has accumulated over the centuries. He makes a stop to spiritual truths to questions regarding the destiny of the human soul after death, and so forth. Descartes calls a halt to real spiritual truths. If one ponders this, it dawns upon one what it means that in the midst of the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, Kant's pronouncements resounded. Enlightenment is the human soul's freeing itself from its self-inflicted dependence, and dare to make use of your powers of reason. This means that one has now ventured to attempt, and Kant's pronouncement is characteristic of this, to entrust the human soul with the capacity to come to the sources of its existence, to the sources of its forces through its own power, through its own greatness. Everything that lies in the bold propositions of Fichte's book that have been cited together with that bold intellectual work that shines forth so magnificently in Western philosophy from the first third of the nineteenth century, derived from this source. If one contemplates this upsurge of the human spirit, which we want to consider today not in terms of the truth or falsehood of its content, but with respect to what the human soul hoped to gain by way of inner confidence and surety of hope, and if one directs one's attention further to the middle of the century, one will perhaps be somewhat wistfully touched by the words of someone who was both an historian of philosophy and also a philosopher in his own right, namely Hegel's biographer Karl Rosenkranz. This is what he writes in his foreword to his book titled The Life of Hegel, 1844. Quote, it is not without a certain melancholy that I part company from this task, out of the necessity that what has been in process of becoming must also come into existence. For does it not seem as though we people of today are merely the grave diggers and memorial makers for the philosophers who were born in the second half of the last eighteenth century and died in the first half of the present century? Close quote. One feels perhaps more from such a remark than from other accounts, how around the middle of the nineteenth century the whole splendor of the philosophical striving from the turn of the eighteenth to the nineteenth century and from the first third of the nineteenth century was rapidly extinguished. But a splendor of another kind immediately emerges, whereas in the eighteen thirties and eighteen forties the brilliance of philosophical activity rapidly faded there arose a new confidence, one could say a new blissful sense of hope. This was already prepared by the great scientific perspectives 
of a physiologist like Johannes Müller and through everything that people like Alexander Humboldt and others had done. But then came such significant achievements as the discovery of the cell and its activity within the living organism by Schleiden and Schwann. In this way, a new brilliant age of scientific knowledge was introduced. And now we see that what has been achieved is followed by everything that will shine immortally in the evolution of the 19th century. We see how the great achievements of physics ensue. Already in the 1840s, the discovery of the law of the conservation of energy and of the conversion of heat by Julius Robert Meyer and by Helmholtz. Anyone who knows the physics of the present knows that physics in its modern form only became possible through this discovery. We see how physics is led from triumph to triumph, how through the discovery of spectral analysis by Kirchhoff and Bunsen, attention is directed from the material conditions of the earth to contemplation of the material conditions of the heavens. In that it is recognized that the same substances manifest themselves in the conditions prevailing in the heavens. We see how physics manages to connect its theoretical foundations with the practical exploitation of its principles, how it succeeds in translating itself into technology, and how it changes the culture of the earthly planet. We see natural forces such as electricity and magnetism becoming hugely significant through being harnessed by technology. We see promises of the future following on a grand scale from studies of the living organic world that Darwin has made and which Haeckel has further developed. All this we see being incorporated in the cultural life of mankind. We see how Lyell's Research from the beginning of the 19th century gives rise to modern geology, which tries to give a picture of the course of earthly evolution in a material sense. We see, too, how immense efforts are constantly being made to integrate human evolution with earthly evolution by means of purely material laws. All this that has led to the position that confidence in the power of thought has come to occupy in the first third of the 19th century has, however, had a deep influence, not merely upon the theoretical world conceptions. For if only this had been the case, one could say, all this has been enacted on a kind of higher horizon of cultural development, but below this is the horizon of the rest of the population who is not concerned with it. No, there is nothing in the evolution of humanity that has not been affected by the impulses that have been delineated here with fleeting strokes. We see them extending their influences everywhere into the mysterious forms of this cultural path of mankind. The human soul itself has in its innermost nature and essence by no means remained unaffected by what has happened. What has taken place over this time could, as a way of characterizing the legacy that the 19th century has left behind, be summed up in a soul that had still been able to listen to what came from Fichte's mouth, as exemplified in his book titled The Destiny of Man. Such a soul would have had certain feelings and experiences regarding its own being, regarding the way that it is able to experience itself. This inner structure with respect to the soul's experience of itself at the beginning of the 19th century would be portrayed significantly differently if we were to consider a soul that did not confine itself to a materialistic way of looking at things, but devoted itself with open senses and with interest to everything that justifiably flows from the legacy of the 19th century. This human soul did not remain unaffected in its innermost being by what was developing around it from the centers of great cities. It was not untouched by the cultural achievements that represented an embodiment of the new intellectual spirit, which had been arrived at through the views regarding the new laws of the mechanistic world order. A soul that had been able to devote itself with its whole heart to a book such as Fichte as titled The Destiny of Man was still free from these views that tend toward regarding the universe and its laws in a similar way 
to the laws that also govern machines, such as locomotives. It has been rightly emphasized that this human soul had to undergo its own changes and developments under the impression of everything that has arisen as of a necessity, as a material cultural fruit of the changes in thinking, feeling, and experiencing taking place in the 19th century. One should but try to understand through particular symptoms what happened as a consequence of the insights furnished by the natural scientific thinking of the 19th century. Consider, for example, how a painter stood in former times before a canvas, how he mixed his colors, how he knew that they would last, for he knew what he had made them with. The 19th century, with the great achievements and advances of technology, instructs the painter to buy his paints. He no longer knows what his senses present to him. He does not know how long the impression of the luster that he has evoked on the canvas will last. To be sure, it is only under the influence of the technology that has arisen from the achievements of natural science that it is possible for us today to have our publishing networks, our modern newspapers, and everything that is then able to make its impression on the human soul, and which has, above all, changed the whole tempo of the human soul. And with it, thought forms, together with the influence on feelings, and hence also the structure of feelings. One needs not only to call to mind the speed with which the achievements of modern technology make things available to people, but it must also be indicated how quickly that which the human mind discovers is impressed upon other human minds through publicity and with what degree of abundance. One may compare what someone learns today through publicity about what goes on in the world, also about what human minds are researching, with the way that a person was able to experience all that was taking place at the beginning of the 19th century. Let us focus on Goethe, for example. It is indeed possible for us to consider him, because from the careful way that he maintained his correspondence, we know more or less exactly what he was doing from one hour to the next, what he was discussing and doing with a particular scholar or writer. The achievements of human intellectual life flowed only gradually into his solitary room in Weimar, but it was of central importance for Goethe that what everyone can receive today through publicity should be able to find its fulfillment. However, this changes the whole of the human soul the whole relationship of the human soul to its surroundings. Let us approach this in another way. People in our time write books or read them. Anyone who writes a book today knows that, after possibly sixty years, it can no longer be read if it is printed on the kind of paper which we owe to the great achievements of technology, for it will have fallen to pieces. Thus one knows, if one is not under any illusion, how greatly what is available today falls short of the way that things used to be done. In one of the lectures in this cycle, I tried to characterize a figure who, even though he is connected with the whole spirit of the first half of the 19th century, nevertheless belongs to its second half, Hermann Grimm. We have seen that he presents himself as a guardian of the legacy of the first half of the 19th century into its second half. However, anyone who reads Hermann Grimm's essays on art with inner understanding will notice two things among others. Especially through his most worthwhile essays, there is everywhere evidence of a certain school that he passed through, a school that one can hear resounding from every essay. This is the school in which he could participate only because in relatively early times, through what one may call chance, he became acquainted with a figure of great stature, namely Emerson, a great preacher and proponent of world conceptions, not in the sense of former times, but in the most modern sense. If we try to form a conception of Emerson and try to immerse ourselves in him, we will find a true spirit of the nineteenth century appearing before us. We could try to sense the pulse of thoughts that appear with the coloring and nuance of the nineteenth century when they relate to Plato, the philosopher, or to Swedenborg, the mystic. 
even if they are still so free from prejudice. They are thoughts of the nineteenth century, that one can only think in a century that was destined to make the telegraph into a means of communicating with the world. In Emerson, one has a figure who, being completely rooted in the culture of the West, raises this culture of the West to what it has eminently become. One has in him a figure who represents the speeding up of thinking. One can try to compare a side in Emerson with a side in Goethe, where one may also gain some insight into Goethe. One may then try, and this is a perfectly natural approach to Goethe, to compare the image of the leisurely Goethe, who was still in accord with the pace of the 18th and early 19th centuries, with the rapidly hurrying nature of a person of the 19th century, a quality that works on in the pulse of thoughts of Hermann Grimm. Then we have seen how, in his wonderful novel titled Un überwindliche Mächte, Unconquerable Powers, Hermann Grimm has even referred to the existence of the human etheric body or life body, how he referred to much that has found its full expression only in spiritual science. However, one can also see how Hermann Grimm enters into everything artistic in a really outstanding way and with great personal interest how he is able to relate more distant periods of time to one another artistically. How he is able to give an interesting, sensitive observation about art. It is impossible for someone who can have insight into such things to think that the thoughts that Hermann Grimm's finest essays present could have been composed in any other age in the way that it was possible for him to do so namely when traveling in the express train from Berlin to Florence or South Tyrol. For this is the assumption that can in many respects be formed from his creative work. Just to imagine that someone like Hermann Grimm could have been able to say in previous centuries, the most important parts of my book on Homer were always written in Greece, near Bozen, in the weeks of spring, because I sense there the influence of spring. That something like this becomes a factor in human life is only possible in the whole atmosphere of the 19th century. In this situation, we feel a streaming together of what springs forth in Hermann Grimm in the form of a wonderful study of art, of what enters fully into the soul of the cultural impulse of the 19th century, with what arises from technology and streaming into it again out of the triumphs of the 19th century. It is impossible to understand something of the deepest issues of the 19th century if one is unable to connect them with the most important legacy of the 19th century, with the natural scientific thoughts with which the 19th century sought to comprehend the world. We can today not do otherwise than admit that within our soul something is living as one of its most important instruments that would not be there without the structure of natural scientific thinking as we have it as a legacy of the 19th century. This is the one side, the side that presents itself to us and what the human soul has made out of itself once it has implemented what Kant characterized in so monumental a way when he said, Enlightenment is the human soul's freeing itself from its self-inflicted dependence and dare to make use of your powers of reason. This tendency of enlightenment that is, making use of the means of research available to the human soul in the way that it is now, passed through the philosophical upsurge and on into the age of natural science. But how has all this come about? From a spiritual scientific point of view, we must envisage a greater degree of connection if we want to understand what has come to expression here, if we want to understand the configuration, the structure of our soul, in which we see on the one hand the effects of the will toward enlightenment, and on the other everything that natural scientific culture has brought about. We must juxtapose at least three successive cultural epochs of human evolution. Reference has already been made to these cultural cycles in connection with these lectures, in the sense of that observation arising from a knowledge of the life of the human spirit, which endeavors to establish how the human soul returns through the ages 
in successive earthly lives and brings from former ages into later ones not only its own faults in order to atone for them in the sense of the great law of destiny, but also what it has inwardly experienced by way of cultural achievements. In the sense of this spiritual knowledge, we shall initially distinguish three ages. Other ages precede these three, but it would not be appropriate to enter into these today. The age that is important for us initially can be called the Egypto-Chaldean Age, which came to an end roughly in the 8th century B.C. If one seeks to characterize it, one can say that in this age the human soul lived in such a way that it still had an inkling of its connection with the whole universe, with the whole of the cosmos. It still felt itself in its destiny on the earth to be dependent on the course of the stars and on the events of the great universal whole. Observations of the dependence of human life on the starry worlds, on the universe as a whole, fill this age of former centuries lasting until approximately the 8th century B.C. The soul felt itself affected in a wonderful way when it immersed itself in the wisdom of ancient Egypt and ancient Chaldea, when it saw how everything depended on feeling the soul's connection with the cosmos that extends beyond the narrow limits of human existence. Something that was important in order to feel this connection of the soul with the cosmos, was, in this cultural epoch, the appearance of, for example, Sirius. And with respect to what a person did for the culture of the soul, to what he utilized for the soul or himself accomplished, was the observation of celestial laws. People felt themselves to be born out of the whole universe. They felt just as much a connection with the extraterrestrial world as with the earthly world. They felt as though they had been transported to the earthly world from the worlds of spirit. This feeling was a last echo of the ancient clairvoyance from which the human soul has originated, as has frequently been mentioned here. This ancient clairvoyance existed in earliest times, and man has lost it in the course of his evolution, in order that he can behold the world in the way he does now. At that time, in the Egypto-Chaldean age, there was still an echo of this ancient clairvoyance. People could still understand the spiritual relationship of soul-spiritual laws to all natural phenomena and wanted to do so. The human soul was, in a certain sense, not isolated within itself at that time. It was, in that it felt itself to be on the earth, connected and intertwined with the forces that streamed down to the earth from the universe. Then came the Greco-Latin time, which, as regards its essential nature and its influences, we can reckon as lasting from the 8th century B.C. until the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries A.D., for the after-effects of this cultural epoch last until then. When one considers this age, and especially in its initial phase, one finds the distinctive quality that the human soul has freed itself in a higher sense from the universe, freed itself in its knowledge, in its beliefs, in the recognition of the forces working within it. And when one observes the Greeks themselves, one is particularly aware that the way that healthy human beings develop themselves inwardly and related to the earth was that they felt themselves to be in connection with their physical bodily nature. This is what the Greek soul felt and expressed in the second of the periods that we are now considering. It is really difficult today to characterize what is meant by this. We tried to bring it closer to our understanding when considering Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci. The Greek lived quite differently with respect to the soul's spiritual realm. This was especially the case, for example, with Greek artists. People today do not even want to acknowledge that there was something particular about the feeling and experience of the Greek soul. That a sculptor who was representing the human form in the true sense could have before him what we would call a model today was inconceivable for a Greek artist. That is not how it was done. 
the relationship of the modern artist to his model would have been unthinkable in ancient Greece. For the Greek knew, my soul's spiritual nature lives in my entire body. He experienced how the forces of this soul spiritual nature flooded into the forming of the arm, the forming of the muscles, the forming of the whole human form. And he knew that just as it flooded into the human form, so did he have to bring it to expression in his sculptural work. He knew to fashion what he himself could experience in the outward material domain in accordance with the inner knowledge of the bodily nature. Thus he was able to say to himself, I am weak, but if I were to develop my will, I could enable this will to work into the forming of the muscles, into the forming of the arm, and thereby become stronger. What he thus experienced he poured into the forming of the figures that he created. The perceiving of the outward forms was not for him the essential aspect, but rather the feeling of man's having been placed into earthly culture and the reproducing of what was experienced outwardly. This was also the experience of the whole personality in ancient Greece. To think of a Pericles or any other statesman like modern statesmen is completely impossible. We see today a modern statesman basing what he thinks and does upon universal principles. When Pericles in ancient Athens appears before the people and carries something out, it is not because he says to himself, Because I see it like this, it must be done. That is not the case. But when Pericles appears before the people and asserts what he wishes, this is his personal will. And if it is agreed to, this happens because Pericles can will what is right, because he experiences it as a personality. In this way the Greek is of a nature that is complete in itself. He lives thinking of himself as a unified being. He can do this because unlike someone belonging to the Egypto-Chaldean age, he no longer feels the connection with the gods, and so on. This connection is still present only as a reverberation of former times. What he directly experiences is, however, that he feels his bodily nature to be connected with the world of soul and spirit. In this way, therefore, while he has a stronger experience of himself as a solitary individual than a person of the Egypto-Chaldean age, he is nevertheless connected with the whole of the rest of nature, because his body, his physical organism, has given him this sense of belonging. One has to feel that in the Greco-Latin age the soul was already more free from the totality of the universe than in the previous period, but it still necessarily felt connected with everything that surrounded it in the kingdoms of nature. For the soul felt itself connected with that which has derived from these kingdoms, the physical human body. It is this feeling that one must see as characteristic of this Greco-Latin age, in which the mystery of Golgotha occurred. Now we see emerging, and with our thinking and feeling we stand in the midst of it, the third period that we have to consider. How does it differ from the Greco-Latin period? The human soul is again much more alone, for the Greek felt himself connected with nature through what he was in his body. Let us imagine that a Greek had the possibility of gazing at the most minute living beings through a nineteenth-century microscope and of thinking of cell theory. This would have been an impossibility for the Greek soul. For once it had gone beyond its initial curiosity, it would have experienced with regard to these observations through the microscope that it is completely unnatural to devise instruments through which one sees things differently from the way they appear to the natural eye, E-Y-E, of the body. The Greek felt himself so connected with his own nature that it would have seemed unnatural to him to see things other than the way they present themselves to the eye. And to make cosmic phenomena visible through the telescope would have seemed to him equally unnatural. The way that the ancient Greek thought was in this regard in many respects, similar to the sensibility of a personality who was inspired by this way of thinking and who coined the beautiful expression 
What are all the instruments of physics in contrast to the human eye, EYE, which is such a wonderful apparatus? That is, the Greek picture of the world was the most fully in accordance with nature, which one attains if one arms the senses as little as possible with instruments and hence with making things different from the way one sees them when one perceives nature directly as it is incorporated in the surrounding world. It is quite different in our time. In our time it has been perfectly natural, and it has been all the more so throughout the cultural development since the period in question began, that what people have sought to identify as an objective, natural, scientific picture of the world they completely separated from what lives in the human soul. Thus the view could arise that one can only experience the truth about the human organization if one directs one's suitably equipped eye toward things, if one investigates living beings with a microscope and uses a telescope to view the heavens, if one uses an instrument which makes up for the imprecision of the eye. But if one considers this whole mental outlook that comes to expression here. One has to say that people are now drawing what lives within them and what is connected with their ego completely away from their picture of the world. The human ego, the human self, is even more alone and solitary than in the age of Greece. If we try to compare the Greek world picture with our picture of the world as it is given to us by natural science, we must say, the endeavor has been made also in practice to render this picture of the world independent from what goes on in the depths of the human soul, from what lives and weaves and is within the human ego. Thus in the age of ancient Egypt and Chaldea, soul and world were, for human experience, one. In the age of Greece, the human soul and the human body were one. But through the human body, man was still connected with his world picture. Now, the soul's spiritual dimension has become more and more separate, wholly separate from what it regards as the justified content of the world picture. The human soul is solitary, contained within itself. We now contemplate the remarkable polarity that appears before us when we approach our own cultural period from the Egypto Chaldean era by way of the Greco Latin age. In contrast to the earlier Greek epoch, what a person in our epoch strives for, above all else, is to arrive at a natural scientific world picture that is independent of his soul nature. The necessary consequence of this is to separate the human soul from what it was connected with in former ages, to cause the soul to fall back upon itself and upon its own consciousness. In the Egypto-Chaldean age, the human soul still directed its soul-spiritual gaze into the cosmic expanses and let itself be inspired by them, let what lived in them flow into it. Even in the age of Greece, man still took what was given to his world picture and imprinted it into art. In the modern age, the world picture is there in its own right separated from a person's soul experience. And yet we must say that when, in modern times, the human soul has thrust itself out of the objective world picture, when it no longer finds itself in a soul sense in what is enacted without, in mechanically objective terms, when it has broken off the connection with outward world existence, it wants, nevertheless, to achieve within itself the power for knowledge as a world picture for its whole existence. To a Greek it would have been incredible if someone had said to him, Dare to make use of your powers of reason, or Enlightenment is the human soul's freeing itself from its self-inflicted dependence. Socratic words were spoken in Greece, but not these words, for a Greek would not have understood them. He would have felt what do I want to do with my powers of reason? Most importantly, to gain a picture of the world. But this picture of the world lives constantly within me, in that the world streams into my forces and my soul's spiritual nature. 
It would be unnatural to make use of my reasoning powers with all that is streaming into me. And someone belonging to the Egypto-Chaldean age would have experienced the demand to make use of his powers of reason to be even more extraordinary and unnatural. His response to the proposition, dare to make use of your powers of reason, would have been, then my best intuitions and inspirations that have streamed toward me from the universe will have forsaken me. Why should I use my reasoning powers, which would impoverish me in my experience, if I availed myself of them in the face of what streams to me from the universe? Thus, as the human souls that have come from previous epochs, we encounter every time a different age. They are, therefore, in Lessing's words, educated in the Egypto-Chaldean age in such a way that the soul feels at one with the world. Then, in the Greco-Latin age, when the soul feels at one with its own bodily nature. And now souls are passing through the time when they must find themselves within their own being. Because they have taken themselves out of the objective picture of the world. So, we find that it is thoroughly appropriate if this age must bring forth a Fichte, together with his book titled The Destiny of Man, and if he poses the question, what if this world picture is perhaps only appearance, an illusion, if it is only a dream? How can the ego that now feels itself impoverished this is an experience that comes from the age, come to an inner confidence. How can it find itself? Thus we see Fichte's teaching of the ego as a necessary result of the whole of evolution. We see how in the 19th century, because of the world picture of natural science, how in Fichte's time, when the power of thought was still blossoming, the ego wants to create for itself clarity through its own forces. And we can characterize the endeavors of Schelling and Hegel that followed Fichte in such a way that we see in them the aspiration on the part of the ego, emancipated from the world picture, to gain a connection with the world through thought. But we see how in this third period that has been characterized, the natural scientific world picture gradually, as it were, also detracts from the ego in that it causes all reverberations of the old world pictures to become impoverished. Such things are not normally sufficiently attended to in our time. If we look back at one of those individuals who have made significant contributions to our natural scientific picture of the world, to Kepler, who has brought about so infinitely much of what now lives on in our scientific view of the world, we find a remarkable idea in his title, Harmonisis Mundi. He extends his gaze from the harmony of the cosmos to the earth as a whole. But this earth is, for Kepler, a gigantic organism that lives in a somewhat whale-like way. At least he finds, when he looks beneath its living aspect, an organism that has a similarity to the earthly organism of a whale. And he says... This giant animal on which we walk breathes, breathes not in the way that a human being does in the times that are defined by the course of the sun, and the rising and falling of the ocean is the sign of the in-breathing and out-breathing of the earth's organism. Kepler finds the way that people envisage how this process takes place to be too limited. With Kepler one should not forget if one is putting forward the connection with Giordano Bruno as a one-sided way of looking at the world, that Giordano Bruno again and again indicated that the earth is a giant organism that has its in-breathing and out-breathing in the ebb and flow of the ocean. And we do not need to go far back in order to encounter the same thought in modern times. There is a beautiful aphorism of Goethe's where he says something like this in a conversation with Eckermann, I see the earth as a giant animal that has its process of inhalation and exhalation in the rising and falling air currents and in the ebb and flow of the sea. That is, the view that conceives of the earth in the way that modern geology does arose only very gradually, 
and another one that we feel still reverberating in Goethe and which comes toward us in a very living way in Kepler and Giordano Bruno was lost. What Kepler, Giordano Bruno and also Goethe thought and felt was something that people experienced very vividly in those ancient times when the soul felt at one with the world. However, it was the natural course of evolution for this sense of being at one with the world to become obscured in the course of time. If we wish to characterize what has been presented in the sense of spiritual science, we arrive at the following picture. Further elucidation of this can be found in my book titled Occult Science, Readers Aside, also known as Esoteric Science, End of Readers Aside. If we contemplate the human soul, not in the chaotic way that modern science does, but with the insights of spiritual science, we find that it is divided into three parts. There is firstly the lowest member of our human soul nature, which, as one might say, still exhibits the most chaotic depths of the human soul, to which the upper parts of human nature do not fully extend, the sentient soul. This is the source of the drives, emotions, passions, and all the undefined feelings that hold sway within the soul. Then we have a higher member of the human soul, the intellectual or mind soul. This is the soul that lives more consciously within itself, which takes hold of itself within its own being, which experiences itself not only in the waves of impulses, longings and passions that it feels rising up from the depths, but which feels compassion and shares in the joy of all things and which develops within itself what we call intellectual concepts and so forth. And then we have that soul member that we call the consciousness soul, whereby the human soul fully experiences itself. In the course of human evolution, these different parts have developed in succession. If we go back to the Egypto-Chaldean age, this was primarily the education for the sentient soul, which human beings were undergoing at that time. For the connections from the great cosmos that lived into human souls, without a person accompanying this with his consciousness, could speak to the sentient soul. The wisdom of Egypt and Chaldea was therefore arrived at unconsciously. If we proceed to the Greco-Latin age, we have there the particular development of the intellectual or mind soul, where through intellectual and mind forces we can see that this soul member has two parts. An inwardness is expressed, which is imbued to a greater extent with consciousness, and in our time we now have, and this arises directly from what has been described, that culture of the human soul, whereby this human soul is to come to a full consciousness of itself, that is to develop the consciousness soul. This is what has come to its highest climax, to its highest level of development in the 19th century, the objective world picture which leaves the soul alone with itself, in order that it can take hold of itself, its ego, with its consciousness soul. It was necessary precisely for inwardly grasping man's innermost essence that the soul related to the world, not in the half-conscious way of the Egyptian world picture, or in the way that we have described it for the Greco-Latin world picture, but that it broke free from the world picture in order to develop within itself, what had to become the strongest part of its nature, the ego, the consciousness soul. Thus in successive earthly lives, the favorable opportunity has gradually arisen for man to develop the sentient soul, the intellectual or mind soul, and the consciousness soul in successive earthly cultures. But now let us look at this legacy of the 19th century, this consciousness soul. It has struggled we can discern this as a basic feature, especially of the 19th century, struggled in the philosophy of a Fichte, in subsequent philosophical statements and propositions. It has struggled even in the case of the more materialistic philosophies, for example, of a Feuerbach, who said, the idea of God is only man's portrayal of himself projected into space. Man placed the idea of God outside himself, 
because he needed to find security in the solitude of his consciousness soul. And if one follows the most radical philosophers, such as Feuerbach and culminating in Nietzsche, one sees the human soul seeking its sovereignty and inner certainty once it has wrested itself free from the world picture that has become objective. Through this process, we see the human soul develop in a wholly regular way what arrived at its culmination in the 19th century, the emancipation of the consciousness soul and its inner grasping of itself through its own power. What is to predominate in a future age is already being prepared at an earlier time. One can verify quite precisely how the development of the intellectual or mind-soul plays into certain cultural phenomena of the Egypto-Chaldean age. And one can see in the Greco-Latin age, especially in its Christian phase, for example in Augustine, how mankind is struggling to prepare the consciousness soul. We must therefore say that our human soul only rightly takes hold of itself when in the midst of the age of the consciousness soul it prepares what is to unfold after the consciousness soul. What must this be? The inner evolution of the human soul presses toward what must be developed, as does the so-called objective world picture itself. We shall conclude by considering several symptoms of this. What has the 19th century, with its brilliant culture, brought about? Let us look at one of the most brilliant scientists of the 19th century, Dubois Raymond, with his objective world picture. As one may read in his title, Concerning the Limits of a Knowledge of Nature, he wants to rescue for the human soul what it needs for its inner security. And he tries to deal with this by means of the idea of the, in quotes, world soul. Because this consciousness soul that has become solitary and set apart from the objective world picture is inexplicable to him. But the objective world picture stands in his way. The human soul makes its experience manifest in the brain, in the nerve fibers and other instruments. Now, Dubois Raymond stands at the frontier of a knowledge of nature. What does he demand if he is to acknowledge a world soul? He demands that one shows him an instrument also in the universe comparable to what exists within man when the human soul thinks, feels, and wills. He says something of this kind. Show me a convolution of ganglia and nerves embedded in the nervous system and nurtured with warm arterial blood under the correct pressure appropriate for the heightened capacities of a world soul. This he does not find. The same Dubois Raymond demands this, who in the same address said, among other things, when one observes someone when he is asleep, from going to sleep to waking up, he can be explained scientifically. But when one observes someone between waking up and going to sleep, together with all the impulses, desires, and passions, the ideas, feelings, and will impulses that flood around him and within him, he can never be explained through a scientific mode of thought. He is right. But let us trace where the legacy of the 19th century has led us here. Duval Raymond says, when I observe a sleeping human being scientifically, I can find nothing that makes the interplay of those forces that are engaged in ideas, feelings, and will impulses explicable to me. For it is illogical to want to look for an explanation for the inner nature of soul phenomena in bodily processes. Just as it would be meaningless if one were to seek an explanation for the organ of the lungs from the inner nature of air. This will be the legacy of the 19th century, that natural science will show that if it stands strictly on its own ground, it cannot explain the involvement of the soul spiritual domain within man. Rather, must it say, when this human body has awakened from sleep, the realm of soul and spirit is something that it breathes in, just as the lungs breathe in oxygen 
or the air. And when it goes to sleep, the soul's spiritual dimension is something that it breathes out, as it were. In the state of sleep, the soul and spirit constitute a wholly independent entity outside the human body. The legacy of the 19th century will be that natural science will be fully united with a spiritual science, which says man has an ego and an astral body, with which he leaves his physical and etheric body in sleep, is during sleep in a purely spiritual world with his ego and astral body, and gives the physical and etheric body over to their own laws. Thus natural science will itself mark out its territory, and through what it has to give, it will show how spiritual science must be added to it as a completion. And if natural science will have a right knowledge of itself, as, for example, belongs to its greatest achievements, as with the natural evolution of organisms from the most imperfect to more perfect states, it will see that precisely in this evolution of natural phenomena, in the sense of the Darwinian theory, there is something in which the evolution of the human soul is not contained, but which must first be grasped by the soul and spirit, if the purely earthly aspect is to be welded into the totality of man's being. It is precisely a rightly understood natural science that will be a wonderful legacy of the 19th century in that it will show how spiritual science is necessary for the completion of natural science. Then, as a necessary consequence, there will be complete harmony between these two and the human soul will come to understand itself in that it awakens the forces that slumber within it and comes to know itself. How? In the Egypto-Chaldean age, people were still in connection with the cosmos, which made manifest to human beings their spiritual background. In the Greco-Latin age, man was still indirectly connected with the cosmos through his body. He still felt the cosmos because he felt the unity between the soul-spiritual realm and the body. Now, the objective world picture has become merely a sum of outward processes. Through spiritual science, however, in that the soul finds itself in its own spiritual depths, it will come to recognize itself as being connected in a new way with the universe. The soul will be able to say, When I look about me, I feel myself connected with all living things, with all kingdoms of nature that are around me. But now that I have passed through the culture of the sentient soul of the Egypto-Chaldean age, through the culture of the intellectual or mind soul of the Greco-Latin age, and after I have taken up the culture of the consciousness soul, in which the attention of the ego has been directed toward material culture, I feel myself linked to a sequence of spiritual realms, downward to the realms of animals, plants, and minerals, if I look out in a material sense upward to the realms of the spiritual hierarchies, to which the soul belongs no less than it is accustomed to see its affinity to the kingdoms of nature. A perspective of the future opens up to the soul, which is fully linked to perspectives of the past. Man has undergone a process of development from the spiritual connections of the past. He will, in the future, work his way into the spiritual realms, the soul will feel itself drawn toward a connection with the kingdoms of nature through its soul-spiritual forces, and it will feel itself to have a connection with the spiritual realms through the spirit-self. For just as our age is characterized as the time of the development of the consciousness soul, so for the future of human spiritual culture, preparations are being made in our time for the development of the spirit self, which will gradually come to maturity. If we view evolution in a spiritual scientific way, we see it as an organic necessity that this legacy of the 19th century should most characteristically bring to expression the task of referring the soul back to itself, of casting it out from its natural environment,
in order to compel it to develop its own soul spiritual forces. And it will be the best legacy of the 19th century if the soul will behold itself as separate from everything, while therefore feeling all the more inspired to unfold its own forces. While the Age of Enlightenment has wanted to make use of its own powers of reason, the coming time must draw forth from their slumber in the depths of the soul the still deeper forces through which the perception of a spiritual world that the soul must achieve in the future will come about. Thus the future will come to be grateful to the nineteenth century that it has placed the soul in the situation where it has the possibility of developing out of itself the higher forces of objective knowledge. This is also a legacy of the nineteenth century. If one considers the inner evolution of the human soul, it must proceed from the unfolding of the sentient soul through that of the intellectual or mind soul and that of the consciousness soul to the development of the spirit self. But man will only find the spirit self if, through the natural scientific way of looking at things that is the legacy of the nineteenth century, he has first been separated from all aspects of the outer world. When one views the legacy of the nineteenth century and then enters further into the details, one will see that the best of the positive results of the scientific legacy of the nineteenth century is the strengthening of the soul, because it then finds itself in what this science is unable to give it. The soul will come to feel with Dubois Raymond. Yes, the sleeping human body can be explained with the laws of physiology, but not what is breathed into it in the form of the soul and spirit. The soul will feel that it must, through spiritual scientific methods, raise to consciousness what is bereft of consciousness in sleep, in order to have a perspective of the spiritual worlds. And then a later Dubois Raymond will no longer stand there baffled when he wants to explain the human body scientifically. For he will say to himself, the human soul is not to be found in the nervous system and the ganglia, so why should I demonstrate the presence of nervous systems and ganglia in the giant world soul? An outstanding figure of the 19th century who only wanted to use what the 19th century could give him for a knowledge of the origins of existence, namely Otto Liebmann, who for a long time lectured in philosophy in Jena, expressed the following thought. Why should one not be able to accept that our planets, moons, and fixed stars are the atoms or also the molecules of a giant brain which is spread out in the universe in a macrocosmic way? However, he thinks that the human intelligence will never be able to gain access to this giant brain, and that therefore it will also be denied the possibility of acquiring knowledge of a spiritual world soul. Spiritual science, however, shows that Otto Liebmann is perfectly right, for that intelligence of which he speaks will never be able to succeed in satisfying human longings in this realm. Because this intelligence has initially become great through emancipating itself from the objective world picture, it should not be a matter of surprise, but rather regarded as quite natural, that a philosophy founded upon this objective world picture cannot find anything by way of a world soul. If a scientist such as Dubois Raymond is unable to find the world soul in the ganglia and nervous system of a sleeping human being. Why should something of the nature of the world soul be found in the giant ganglia of a giant brain? No wonder the physiologist has to despair of doing so. But these foundations are the best legacy of the nineteenth century. They show that the human soul has been led back to itself and must seek and find the connection with the spiritual worlds not through observation, but through the development of its inner forces. If the human mind considers that world picture 
which it knows as the Darwinist theory of evolution, it will find that the greatness of this theory rests on the fact that it, the human mind, has taken itself out of it. Man would not have arrived in his evolution at the point where he has come if he had not taken himself out of the world picture. When he understands this, he will understand that he cannot find in this theory of evolution what he first had himself to take out. If one rightly understands Darwin's theory of evolution, one will find that it is not in contradiction with it to believe the spirit researcher when, as he looks behind sense-perceptible phenomena, he beholds a spirit in which the human soul is rooted as a spirit. So this concluding lecture is intended to show that there is in truth not the slightest contradiction between what is here meant as spiritual science and the true, genuine achievements of natural science, and that if one rightly enters into what the world picture of natural science had to become in accordance with the course of human evolution, which spiritual science has identified, one knows that this cannot be otherwise, and that because it has become what it is, the natural scientific world picture is the most perfect means of education for what it, the human soul, is to become, an essence that from the consciousness soul is aspiring toward the spirit self. With this, spiritual science is being referred to as that which belongs today to the culture of our time. What has been prepared in the Egypto-Chaldean age with the culture of the sentient soul, what was further developed in the Greco-Latin age through the culture of the intellectual or mind soul, has found its further unfolding in our time in the culture of the consciousness soul. But everything that comes later has been prepared previously. So just as it can be said that a culture of the consciousness soul, which still has long to last in our time, already existed in Socrates and Aristotle, so must it already be the case that here, within our own age, there can be the source for a true teaching of the spirit self. This is how the human soul may understand itself in connection with those worlds in which it, as a spirit in the spirit world, is rooted. In addition to everything else that it represents, the natural science of the 19th century is a means of education and the best means of education for spiritual science. From these winter lectures it may perhaps emerge that from the spiritual scientific views that have been presented here about the legacy of the 19th century, a sure foundation will be found for spiritual science which should not become a conglomeration or chaos of something arbitrary, but something that rests on just as secure a foundation as the natural science that is so admired. If one believes that there must necessarily be a break between what natural science is and has made possible and spiritual science, one would be mistaken about this spiritual science. If, however, one sees how natural science had to become entirely what it has indeed become, so that the human soul finds the path to the spirit in the new way that it must find it, one will recognize it as that which must necessarily be placed within evolution, as something that has within it the seeds for that period that will follow ours in the same way that our present period follows on from the previous one. Then the apparent conflicts between the natural scientific and the spiritual scientific world pictures will be reconciled. Of course, I do not even remotely believe that in the brief time of this lecture, which has lasted so long, I shall have been able to say more than a very little of what can be discerned from spiritual science about the coming significance of the natural scientific path of the 19th century in all its many forms, but perhaps through the extension of what has been presented in the souls of the esteemed listeners, through following up what has been indicated today, especially by comparing spiritual scientific results 
with the rightly understood results of natural science, it will be seen that the necessity of an involvement on the part of spiritual science in the future of human evolution is a clear conclusion from a spiritually oriented study of the evolution of mankind. These lectures were formed from, and their basic tone always informed by, this awareness of an inner evolutionary necessity. This lecture in particular has sought to evoke the feeling that it may appear justified that the mere confidence that figures such as Fichte wanted to gain from the consciousness soul cannot be achieved out of the consciousness soul as such that lives enclosed within their thoughts. But rather, when the soul sees and recognizes that it finds something in itself quite other than its mere intelligence and reason, when it finds within itself the forces that lead to imagination, inspiration, and intuition, that is, to life in the spiritual world itself, and when it realizes that this may, through the rightly understood legacy of the nineteenth century, again be spoken about out of a truly inward certainty also in the first third of the twentieth century. Hegel, boldly building upon what he believed he had understood purely out of the consciousness soul, once spoke some significant words in his lectures about the history of philosophy, and we may conclude with a paraphrase of what he said in order to characterize not so much a conceptual summary, but rather a feeling that arises like an elixir of life from spiritual scientific observations. We shall, with some changes, bring to expression in Hegel's words what the soul can experience for its sense of certainty by way of resources necessary for existence and for its life's work, what it can experience with respect to the great riddles of existence concerning destiny and immortality. All this is so that the soul is met with the right cosmic light when it, though now not out of an indefinite and abstract quality of the consciousness soul, but out of a knowledge that cognitive forces slumber in the soul that make it a citizen of spiritual worlds, when it is wholly pervaded with a feeling such that this feeling becomes the direct expression of the spiritual science that is intended, which makes the soul sure in itself and full of hope. The human spirit may and should believe in its greatness and in its power, for it is a spirit from the Spirit. And with this belief there can be nothing in the universe, in the totality of existence, that is so hard and impenetrable that it should not be made manifest to it in the course of time, in so far as it has a need for it. What was initially held in hidden secrecy in the universe must become ever more manifest and become available to the seeking soul as its knowledge increases in order that it can develop it to an inner power, to inner certainty, to the inner valuing of existence and life. That is the end of Lecture 14, the last lecture in the book, Results of Spiritual Research by Rudolf Steiner, the Collected Works, Volume 62, tra translated by Simon Blaxland Delang.